Well, good morning. Good morning. Did you enjoy fall break? Yeah. yeah, praise the Lord. Could it have been longer? Yeah. Well, just hang in there before you know it. The end of the semester will be here, right? And so labor hard, labor tirelessly, and you'll get to the finish line. We welcome our online students as well. We thank the Lord uh, for them. Hope they had a good break also. We have today uh, in chapel with us one of my friends, uh, Brother Tyler Shields, Dr. Tyler Shields now. As of uh, last week, he finished his doctoral program, defended his dissertation. So congratulations, brother, on that. I know what a joy and excitement that that is. He's the pastor of First Baptist Church of Barberville, Kentucky. He and I grew up uh, there in th that neighborhood, in that community, and we have the privilege to serve churches there. And so he comes to us today uh, to preach the Word of God. His undergrad studies was done at the University of Kentucky. Go Big Blue. <laughs> Hard crowd, man. Hard crowd. Uh, he did his graduate, his graduate studies at uh, the Univer or Liberty University. And as I said, just finished the doctoral work. He's married to Caitlin. And they have two kids, I believe, boy and a girl, right? And so uh, we're thankful that he has came this way today to preach the Word of God to us. Let's pray together, and then our worship team will come and lead us in praising the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, or for all that you have done, all that you continue to do. We pray your blessings on our time together this morning. Father, as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth, may you give us strength to lift high your praises today, Father. May you bless your servant, Lord, who stands to preach your word with the words that you'd have him to speak. Father, may you use him mightily today, Lord, to deliver a word to our hearts that will transform our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Clear Creek, great to be back with you after fall break. Let's stand together and worship our Savior.
as we start this second semester, I pray this is our cry, that Christ is enough for us for what's ahead. Join us as we sing this morning.
now we're going to enter into our time of prayer. And I know coming right off of a break like all of us just had, it's very easy for us to feel sluggish, for us to have that sense of um, we don't really want to get started just yet. We want to hold on to that break. But I tell you what, when you think about this next hymn we're going to sing, In the Garden, and how God, Jesus, walks with us and talks with us and tells us that we are His own, that should be our motivation to get out of bed every morning. That should be that push that pushes us through that paper that's about to come again or the rest of the semester that's ahead. It is Christ alone walking with us. So during this time, pray for strength for this semester. Standing, sitting, or coming to this altar, join us in this time of prayer.
Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Speaker, through the word of God, that we will go out, Lord, in order to help as many as possible come to walk in fellowship with you. Lord, that we don't have to be alone. We don't have to be out of the garden any longer. God, because you sent the perfect shepherd, the perfect caretaker of the garden, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins and to be raised the third day. God, that is reason for us to rejoice and to be glad this morning. So enter as we enter in this time of worship through your word, Lord, let it change us. Let it refocus our attention to the task at hand and let us give you and you alone the glory. In Jesus' holy name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Well, it is... Uh Certainly a privilege to be at Clear Creek Baptist Bible College this morning. And I appreciate you all being here. I guess you don't have much of a choice, though, do you? Uh, but thanks anyway. And uh, it's a, as I prepared for this message, Josh asked me a while back to come and, and preach at a chapel service. And we finally got the date lined out. And I, I thought, I put, tried to put myself in your shoes and think when I was preparing for ministry or when I was... Uh, learning more about the Bible and, and studying, what would I need to hear years ago? And, and, and I think uh, if I could go back, I would want someone just very simply to tell me to keep my focus. And when I say that, I'm not talking about stay focused on studies or stay focused on goals or focused on church vision or even focused on people. As important as all of those are, and we do have to focus some of our time and efforts and energy on those things, I would want somebody to look me in the face and say, Tyler, keep your eyes on Jesus. When everything else is going on, when, when you're, you're, you're working hard for the church, when you're studying for school and all this stuff, just stay focused on Jesus. I think I would want someone to tell me, when you go about your ministry, try and model your ministry after the ministry of Jesus. There's a lot of great preachers out there, right? There's a lot of great uh, ministers, and, 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 and I fall into this trap myself of trying to steal their ideas and, and do things that they do that is work. But man, woman, sorry, follow Jesus. I want to look at Matthew chapter 9 this morning, verses 35 through 38. Very short passage, but it is so cram-packed with little nuggets. At this point in Jesus' ministry and His life here on earth, He's been baptized by John the Baptist. He's been tempted by the devil. He has begun His public ministry. He's called all 12 of His disciples. He has healed the sick. He's driven out demons, He has forgiven sins, and even calmed the stormy waters. And we come to the end of Matthew chapter 9, and Matthew gives us several important insights into Jesus' person and ministry. And as we look through this this morning, I want you to ask yourself this que these questions. Here's where I want you to focus. What if our ministry looked more like Jesus' ministry? How different would your life be if you just simply modeled Jesus? How different would the churches that we serve be if we modeled Jesus' ministry. Not even that, if we were more like Jesus as individuals. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. The Bible says, Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, go. It's not what it says, is it? Therefore, preach. No. Therefore, pray. 
to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into His harvest. As you begin your ministry, some of you are probably already in ministry, you're going to realize how important priorities can be in setting priorities for time and for things that have to be done. There's going to be things that come up that everybody around you thinks is so important and it has to be done right now and it has to be done very well. And if we're honest, you're going to say there's, there are other things that, that, that you probably should have done or should have done better and you've either overlooked it or you just actually just totally messed it up. That happens too. And I guarantee somebody in your church will very graciously come to you and say, remind you what you should have done and how you should have done it. Yeah. You, ever, you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, very graciously. But when it comes to ministry, I think the first thing we've got to realize, if it mattered to Jesus... It should matter to us. Jesus, the Bible says, went to all the towns and all the villages. Apparently they all mattered to Him. And what did He do when He got there? Several very specific things that Matthew tells us. First of all, He taught them. And what do you think Jesus taught? I think Jesus taught the truth. The absolute truth. Likewise, when we go out to wherever God sends us, we need to teach and proclaim and preach the truth even when the truth is not popular. God's Word, friend, is still the standard. And it's not changing. And it is absolutely true. He also not only taught, but He preached. Now this word's a little different than teaching, and it, it means to proclaim an important message. It's, it almost paints the picture of someone going into a king's court or into a royal court and proclaiming a very, very important truth or message. For us, it literally means to share the gospel message. How many know there are a lot of false gospels being preached and taught all throughout even our own nation, even our own state? Many will say that salvation comes from works or that salvation will bring about this life of blessing and prosperity. All these different things. But the gospel says something totally different, doesn't it? The true gospel. The real gospel, the truth says that we are all miserable sinners who desperately need a Savior. That's the true gospel. The true gospel says that God so loved the world, help me out here, that He sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever... That, now, that's any town, any village, any person, right? That whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the true gospel that we need to preach. I would encourage you to never be afraid or never be ashamed to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He taught, He preached, He also, the Bible says, healed. It says our Lord saw all kinds of people with all kinds of afflictions. And these people apparently mattered to the Lord enough that He took the time, the Bible says, to heal them. Now, I think that people still need healing today. Now, that's not a gift that I have. I mean, it'd be awesome if, if we could go in and, and, and lay hands on somebody and they, you know, whatever's bothering them goes away. But people not only need a physical healing, they need ministers, men and women of God to come to them and to encourage them, to pray with them, to pray for them, to lift them up. People in a, in a dark and broken and hurting world, especially the world that we're in right now, desperately need some source of hope and light that brings a sense of healing to their lives. A lot of people have problems. Amen? And guess who can meet those problems? The church can. I think the church probably would do a much better job than any government... Uh, organization to meet the needs of people that have problems. People are hungry. We can feed them. People need clothes. I think we can put clothes on their backs. And meeting these physical needs, by the way, which Jesus did, serves as a bridge for us to meet the greatest need that anybody has, which is the need to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think in this passage, Jesus was modeling for His disciples what they would do after He left. They may not have realized it at that time, but eventually they would be the ones going and teaching and preaching and even healing. And it reflects the great commission of the church to go and disciple the nations, to baptize them, to teach them to obey all of Christ's commands, and then the promise to remember that He's with us even to the very end. I think about people that we often overlook or we forget about we, we there's there's people out there that we whether we mean to or not we act as if they don't matter uh, anybody from barberville knox county here all right hi emily how uh, good to see you back there 
What's going on in Barberville? Y'all may even know right now. What's getting ready to ramp up? The mighty Daniel Boone Festival has come to town, right? Everybody in Knox County is getting ready to go to the Daniel Boone Festival. Great opportunity. Our church kind of backs up against where the festival's at, so it's a great opportunity to witness to and, and to minister to all these people coming into town. But there's a group every year that is overlooked within that. And, and I guarantee there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of Christians that go by these people to ride the ride with their kid or to play the game at the carnival or whatever the case may be. But we overlook the carnival workers that pour into town. This morning we actually invited all of those carnival workers to come into church and have breakfast with us. And we probably ended up with about 65 different workers and they were from all over the world and we were able to to love on them and to just let them know that they're not overlooked that they actually matter to us the church and also more importantly they matter to Jesus and, and we think about let me let me just paint this picture for you imagine a, a a drunkard a drunk man that stayed drunk you know for years and years in the outer slums of Sao Paulo Brazil how much does that man really matter how much does his soul matter? Is it actually worth one of us getting on an airplane, flying halfway around the world, and preaching the gospel that that man in that bar would hear it? The reason I say that, that, that to, of all the mission trips I've got to go on, that one soul right there stands out to me more than any other. I went to Brazil a few years ago, and we were preaching every night in this little church on the outskirts of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And a lot of people were coming in from the community, a lot of people getting saved. And I think it was the last night we, we kind of cranked things up. Music was blaring and the gospel was being preached. And, and there, you know, in the, in the warm season, the doors are open. You can just hear all this stuff all around the community. And across from the church, across the road, there's a little bar. And in this bar, this man, I think, had spent most of his life there. And he was drunk this particular night. But some, for whatever reason, the, 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 the work of the Holy Spirit, that music singing about the Lord and singing His praises, got into His ears and got into His heart. And when we began to preach the gospel and someone was translating that into Portuguese, apparently he heard it all the way across the road in the bar and he made his way out of the bar across the street just in time for us to give the invitation and he literally stumbles down to the altar to get saved. Amen. That man matters. And if pe people matter, I think every person every soul matters and when we go into our ministries i, I think that we got to avoid the trap of overlooking anybody the bible says jesus went to all the towns and all the villages and i think if if a person matters enough for jesus to die for them on the cross they should matter enough to us to take the gospel to them if it mattered to jesus it must matter to us and the fact is they all matter to jesus second thing we see from verse 36 let me read verse 36 again it says, when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them. And here's why. Because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. The second thing I want us to realize from this passage in Matthew is if it moved Jesus, it should probably move us. Compassion. It literally means a yearning within the bowels. It means that Jesus was so deeply moved in His love and compassion for these people that he, he felt it deep within His guts. He was so emotionally stirred that he, he felt a sensation in His body. When's the last time you were that moved over a person? Over a, a person's soul for their situation? But Jesus, the Son of God, was moved emotionally that much. Why? Matthew says they were distressed and dejected. Now let's, let's break this down a little bit. He, he uses very specific language. Distress means that they were weary, they were tired. It can literally mean that they had been harassed and were just simply worn out. I think there's a lot of folks today that, that life harasses them. You look at their, their situation, you're like, my goodness, man, how do you go through all that? Why, why you? Why does all this stuff happen? Maybe it's poverty and addiction and cancer and death and loss and, and moral failure and, and now COVID and people are just weary and worn out, dejected means that they were thrown aside or cast away. Are we going to be honest and say that we often throw away or cast aside people that are distressed and broken? We have far too often. 
many people feel forgotten and every person has this basic need to, to feel like they belong. And how has the church helped people feel that? Not that they just belong and that they just matter, but more importantly, that they have a role in Christ's kingdom and a purpose. Many people are cast aside by society. They're distressed. They're dejected. They're running here. They're, they're running there. They're just doing whatever comes next in life without any vision, without any direction, without any purpose. Many of them have no hope, and they're just like sheep running around with no shepherd. Notice what Matthew doesn't say. He doesn't say that Jesus blamed them. He doesn't say that Jesus condemned them, although probably some of them deserved it. Some of them probably had made some poor choices that had got them to where they were in life. But Jesus didn't do that. He didn't go around them or even avoid them. He simply felt compassion for them. He hurt for them. You go through your ministry, you're going to realize there's a lot of people that are just really hard to love. They're hard to deal with. They're going to try your patience. Uh, there's one man in particular that always stand out to me. His name was J.D. Couch, Jimmy Darrell Couch from Leslie County. Everybody from Leslie County, Kentucky has two first names, Jimmy Darrell Couch. So J.D. was a good man, but he was a lost man. And he was a very hard-hearted man. He had spent pretty much his entire life working in a funeral home, and he'd seen so many things over the years, and he'd seen some stuff in church that he didn't like, and he, he believed in God, but he just was lost as lost could be. And we had prayed for Jimmy Darrell. We'd tried to talk to Jimmy Darrell, and he'd come to church, and he'd, he'd, he'd stand in the very back row week after week, and then we'd give the invitation, and he'd look at me with them big old sad eyes, and he'd go home lost week in and week out. Couldn't reach him. Even go, listen to this, we'd even go visit Jimmy Darrell at his house. His wife would let us in and Jimmy Darrell would run and hide in his bedroom and wouldn't come out like a kid. One day, I can't take credit for it, it was the Holy Spirit finally broke through Jimmy Darrell's hard heart and Jimmy Darrell got saved and got the opportunity to baptize him in the Kentucky River. It wasn't too long after that that he went on to be with the Lord. But what I found is that the people that are the hardest to love are the ones that need our love the most. And Jesus told us to love such people. <laughs> he said, love your enemies in Luke chapter 6. He says, do what's good, lend expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For He is gracious, get this, to the ungrateful and the evil. And thank God that He is. If it moved Jesus... It should move us. His love, His compassion for people should be our attitude and our mindset for ministry because, again, they all matter. But Jesus didn't stop there. He was moved to action. Look at the last two verses again. 37 says, Then He said to His disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest, to send out workers into His harvest. The last thing I want us to see this morning is if it motivated Jesus, it should motivate us. Jesus saw and He knew how vast the harvest really was. And, and I think He knew that the means for working that harvest were scarce. There weren't a lot of laborers. But Jesus, like we're often not, He was not paralyzed by the problem. He, and he began with the most important aspect of your ministry. He said, therefore, pray. Don't start a new program. Don't make the preacher start wearing skinny jeans. Don't water down the gospel so you don't offend anyone. Begin by praying. He says, this problem is so big. There are so many lost people. The harvest is so great. There are people that are distressed and dejected. They're literally dying every day and going to hell. So you need to pray. The harvest is the Lord's. And that's something that I've had to learn throughout my ministry. It's not my harvest. It's not my church. It's not my gospel. It belongs to Him. And He's the one that can send the workers into the harvest. And He's the one that can reap it as well. I remember, I'll share this story about prayer with you. Several years ago, I was a younger, hotshot 
preacher thought we were doing great things, and we were. Things were going really good in this church. And we decided that we would set a goal for baptisms this year. And our goal was uh, pretty lofty, and, and, our, and we wanted to uh, get all these folks saved and lined up, committed to baptism. We were going to have a big baptism service celebration, and we hit the ground running, man. We were sharing the gospel. We were going door to door. We were doing anything we could to meet people and reach people and share the gospel with people. But there was one problem. Nothing was working, even though we were doing everything right. And about six months into this campaign, and we were failing miserably, myself and an, an old deacon in the church went to a KBC training. On, I think it was on evangelism. And we were t- sitting there, and we're like, yeah, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. And they started talking about goals. We're like, yeah, we got, we got goals. We set a goal for uh, baptism. We're shooting for that goal. And I'll never forget what Don McCutcheon said. He said, Pastor, don't shoot for it. Pray for it. And I turned to the deacon. We kind of looked at each other. and We're like, that's it. That's the missing thing that we've not been doing right. And here's how we solved that. We set aside a time on Thursday evenings when nothing else was going on in the church. And we said, church, we feel like we need to come together, not for a devotion, not to hear anybody preach or sing or do anything else. We need to come together as a church and pray. Church will be open from this time to this time. And we'd start out, we'd all gather up in a circle if it was two or if it was 20. We'd come together and we'd go around the circle and we would pray. And we would pray specifically for the people that we knew in our church and community that were lost, that they would be saved and that God would help us. We actually made a big poster with all these blank places we could put people's names on. And that poster had not gotten filled up. And we prayed that God would begin to put those names in those places. And you know what happened when we actually began to pray? One by one, these people that we thought couldn't be saved or wouldn't be saved suddenly started getting saved. And we not only met the baptism goal, God far exceeded that. And Jimmy Darrell Couch was actually one of those names that got added to that list that year. If it mattered to Jesus, it should matter to us. If it moved Jesus, it should move us. And if it motivated Jesus to pray, it should motivate us as well. Imagine how ministry would look if it really, truly resembled the things that Jesus did. If we, as pastors and ministers and worship leaders, as Christians, imagine if our hearts and our attitudes and our motivations were much more like those of Jesus. I got a lot of goals for ministry, but my main priority for my life, for myself, is to be more like Jesus every single day. And I would encourage you to do the same. I want to conclude this morning, Josh, if it's okay to be obedient to what Jesus said. And I'd like to pray uh, for the workers that He's sending out into the harvest. And I'd like to pray for that harvest. And if you would, let's just join, join in prayer as we pray specifically for you all who are going out into the fields of harvest. Let's pray. Father... God, I thank You that You not only sent us a Savior who took on our sins and died on the cross for us, but He modeled perfectly everything that we should do for ministry, for life, for obeying You, for following You. And God, as I stand before this awesome crowd of laborers, of workers, Lord, I pray that you would send them into the, into the fields. God, it may be somewhere in the far corners of this wor- world. It may be right down the road. God, wherever you send them, I pray that they would model Jesus. They'd be like Jesus. Lord, I pray that they would realize that every person matters, that every soul matters. And God, I pray that the harvest, Lord, would be good soil. I pray, Lord, that You would do the things that only You can do, that You would soften hearts, that You would open deaf ears and blind eyes to receive the gospel. 
God, I pray that your spirit, even right now, Lord, maybe years in advance of these men and women going out to this harvest field, I pray right now you would begin a work in someone's heart somewhere in this world to receive that gospel truth. Father, I pray that you'd be with them as they study. I pray that you would help them to stay focused, not only on their studies and serving you, but stay focused on Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would bless their families. God, I pray that you would provide for them. I pray, Lord, in the proper time that you would call them and they would see exactly the next step they need to take, God, whether it's into a church or a ministry role or or wherever you're leading them. Be with them, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.